Good afternoon. I'm Wing Liu. I'm from Northwestern University. And it is a pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker. And uh, Miguel Bizarre. He is assistant professor at Delft University of Technology. Amazingly, he got a PhD from Northwestern University. And then immediately, he went to Caltech to be a postdoc. But he actually received many awards before he came to Northwestern. And he's also a Fulbright scholar at Northwestern University. And recently, he received a very prestigious award. I think it's called Van Nee Grant for young researchers in the Lebanon. Now, I know uh, Miguel, and I'd like to tell him he is a very, you know, talented individual, and he's very assertive. That's the word I like to put him. And he's a very promising, you know, uh, he was a very promising PhD student at that time. Uh, he's, even though he's assertive, but he's very ambitious. Okay, and he always strive for the originality and also excellency in his research. And he also has a very mature and impressive research vision. And I think his character is he likes to have deep understanding of what he wants to learn. And my understanding would be he has a very deep understanding of the data-driven mechanics of materials, in particular, very, very complex materials. And he is now a very strong proponent of data-driven theories in mechanical science. He envisioned a new era of design of materials and structures through artificial intelligence. So he always planned on the next big research directions and I asked him, what is that? He said, I'm not going to tell you. And I say, well, that means I need to introduce you. So let's welcome Miguel. Thank you very much, for Professor Liu, for the, the kind introduction. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. It's really an honor for me to, to present my recent work uh, today that it's uh, entitled Design of a Supercompressible Metamaterial by Machine Learning and Additive Manufacturing. Okay, so um, I would like to start with a simple statement uh, that we all know, I believe, materials of the future will be adaptive, multi-purpose, and tunable. But if we keep doing things like we've done in the past, doing design by experimental trial and error, we know that that limits the search for untapped regions of the solution space. So machine learning, I think, may help us in this new quest. And to illustrate that, I would like to start with an example that I've been working on in the last couple of years at Delft. It all started with a very simple idea, actually, uh, when I was at Caltech in, uh, in the Space Structures Lab of Sergio Pellegrino. Uh, at the corner of the lab, it has a beautiful museum, actually, and at the corner of the lab, you will find uh, a structure, a structure from the 80s called a deployable mast. And if you actually Google this or, or look for papers, you won't find much online, actually. There's a few papers, and there's a few patents, a couple, I believe. But there's not much more than that, actually, because this is very specific to satellite design. So what they do is they take these structures, they put them in, in, in satellites, and then they deploy to open up solar sails, for example, of a satellite. So it's a very specific function. So when I was leaving the lab and, and I was touring it, I had this idea of, well, but why not transforming this structure that is known from the 80s and try to use additive manufacturing to come up with a super compressible metamaterial? Would this be possible? 
But as I set about to do these things, um, I do, did not know, honestly, if this was viable, and I didn't know any of the, the analytical theory or predictions for this sort of structure. So I thought that this was a great example of trying to explore the design space uh, by doing data-driven analysis. So that's what we uh, did, me and my two students, Piotr Glovaki and Michael Aldern. So how does this work? It's very simple, actually. So first you start by defining uh, um, the design space, by doing design of experiments. And this is not more than just sampling, okay? You're just, you define the bounds of your space and you sample within the space. So you start by defining the topology of your problem. We know the, the deployable structure that I mentioned to you about. In fact, I changed a little bit the, the topology of it to also have this conical angle and a few other alterations such as the cross-section of those vertical elements could be general. It doesn't need to be just a circular cross-section, it could be something else. So then, uh, basically, you, have, you define this structure, it's actually quite simple. You have the top uh, ring over there, you have the, the bottom ring here, and then you have these vertical elements uh, that are called longerons that uh, uh, are actually uh, will buckle so that the structure can be very compressible and deployable as well. And then, uh, like I said, these cross sections of the longerons can be some general. They don't need to be to have a particular uh, cross section. All right. So if you define these parameters, these input parameters for your design space, uh, you, it will amount to seven. Uh, the cross-sectional area of your longerons, the two moments of, inner, of uh, the two second moments of area. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, the torsion constant J. P is the height of the cell. The ratio between the top diameter and the, the bottom diameter of the support rings, and the ratio between the the shear and the Young's modulus of the of the material, the base material that you have that define the, the metamaterial. So seven parameters. It's not a huge design space, but it's fairly large already. And then what you do is you do standard design of experiments. For example, two of the very common techniques are Latin hyper hypercube sampling or Sobel sequence. We chose Sobel sequence for specific reasons that we can discuss later on. But you have an example here of a three-dimensional space uh, and all the sampling points that you can put in, in the space. Of course, this is a seven-dimensional space, but you know we, we cannot visualize that. It's just uh, to, to illustrate. All right, so this is fairly straightforward. You, you sample the space, you have all these points, and then uh, what you have to do in this particular problem is that you also have to, to take into account that buckling we're exploring buckling to have this sort of instability and have this super compressibility, hopefully. So buckling is an imperfection sensitive property, which means that if you have geometric or material imperfections, the performance, the buckling load, will get a, a huge hit uh, on the performance based on, on small imperfections. In this particular structure, we're actually a bit lucky here because uh, it's very simple to understand what's the most important imperfection even before doing any sort of experimentation or anything like that, which was what we did. We didn't do any experimentation first. So if you analyze the first buckling modes, you know that this structure, because it's pinned, it's actually very free to rotate at the top. So the first buckling mode actually is supposed to coincide. That's what we predicted. It should coincide with the biggest imperfection, geometric imperfection that you have in the material. So then what we did was something very simple. We didn't have experimentation, like I said. So we, based on the tolerances at the, between the longerons and the support rings, we estimated that the, the imperfection could have a, a mean of four degrees or so at the top in the rotation. And then we assumed that it was a log normal distribution and uh, um, with uh, this, this four degrees of mean, like I mentioned. And uh, on the bottom, right, uh, you see, for example, one uh, particular imperfection value, let's say four degrees. Okay, so to recap, you have a design space that is defined by seven uh, parameters, and then you have to understand that there's an imperfection sensitivity, and you try to model that imperfection the best you can with a very few, very little information you have at the moment. All right, so then you move forward, and now that you have the, all the input points, 
you have to do computational analysis to predict how the structure behaves. So uh, in this case, of course, we used uh, finite element models. Uh, it could be something else, of course, but in this case, it's finite element analysis. And uh, here you see uh, do two examples of, of this structure. One is taller than the other. This one has three laundrons. This one has 11 and so on. And you have to understand as well that these seven-dimensional space, you sample it, you then sample randomly on the statistical distribution for the imperfection, and then you conduct the finite element analysis and you have a stochastic response, correct? Because there's the imperfection sensitivity there. So um, then you, you run through the design of experiments, you run your, through the sampling points, and you start collecting data. You start to, to build your response database and in this case, we saved two, two quantities of interest. The critical buckling stress, so if you think about buckling load divided by the area, symbolized by the two stars, since we're in Texas, and uh, the area below the curve, which is symbolized, it took me a long time to do this, so it symbolized these, uh, the area there and the area over there. Okay, so you have uh, both quantities of interest and you start saving them for all the different designs that you have over there. And like I said, because you have imperfections, if you were to select just one of those sampling points, you would have, in, for example, do 100 or 1,000 realizations for this design, you'd get 1,000 different curves, which are uh, those curves over there. And if you compute the area below all of these curves, you would get this statistical distribution over here. And we fitted a, a few very well-known statistical distributions there for your, for your reference, okay? All right, so you do the simulations, you start collecting data, that data is statistical. And then what you have to do is you have to do machine learning. But in this case, because the data is uh, not is stochastic, you, you should use Bayesian machine learning techniques so that you can deal with this uncertainty that is uh, embedded in the, in the response database. So in order for us to understand how Bayesian machine learning works, I'm gonna go on a slight digression here so for the people that are not familiar with it, the ones that are, you can sleep for the next three slides. So uh, let's take a very simple example of, uh, Gauss, that illustrates what Gaussian processes are. So if you have a 1D problem where, where you have your input X and your output Y, and if your input is the property, let's say the diameter of the top ring or something like that, um, the same design, like I said, for the same diameter, you can have a spread of uh, responses because of the imperfection, like I mentioned. Now, if your problem is simple, you can assume that uh, the standard deviation of the response at uh, every point is the same. So if you had a simple problem, you could assume constant variance at every point, which is called almost cadastic noise. But this is not foreseeable to be the case here because maybe a taller cell could have a, a higher, higher imperfection sensitivity than a shorter cell, for example. But what you can do is you can actually assume that that uh, uncertainty is different at every different input point that you have. That is called heteroscedasticity, and Gaussian processes can deal with this quite well. So what you do then is you go to these points, and for our community, it's actually quite simple to understand what's going on. Q is the, uh, the quantity of interest, energy absorbed, for example. And then what you're trying to do is you're trying to, to find this response surface, this F, and the corresponding noise or the corresponding uncertainty for your property, okay? That's our goal. Find F, the mean value, and the corresponding uncertainty. And in Gaussian processes, what you do is you define a kernel, just like what you would do in standard mesh-free methods. People that are familiar with mesh-free methods will recognize this. So you have a kernel function that basically correlates two different points in different locations of your design space, and you add this noise which is called a Tikhonov regular regularization. So it doesn't really matter, but basically you have this kernel. And just like in mesh-free, you define a kernel function. It could be, for example, the very well-known uh, uh, squared uh, exponential uh, uh, kernel. 
And this kernel has parameters that are called hyperparameters that you don't know. These are your unknowns for which you fit to the data. And that's why it's a non-parametric machine learning method where you try to find these in such a way that you predict better the mean response and the uncertainty. So this is Gaussian processes in a nutshell. Uh, but there is one important thing that you should keep in mind. The difference compared to mesh-free is that you take the, the this is in, in mesh-free it's called the moment matrix. In Gaussian processes this is called the covariance matrix, but it's the same thing. But then you associate a Gaussian process to this, okay? Which means that in practice you're passing an infinite amount of functions through your data set so that you can replicate the uncertainty, okay? I apologize for the people that know about this already, but it's just so that we're all on the same page. Okay, so if you do this, then you can predict the mean and uh, the uncertainty of your data by uh, putting this into the, the Bayes rule, into the Bayesian framework. So you define the likelihood and the prior, and then you have to integrate the marginal likelihood, which is the denominator over there. And here's where, where things get tricky, because when you're integrating that denominator, and don't worry about the, the actual equation itself, but when you're integrating this denominator, if you do not assume that your uncertainty is Gaussian, then you have to integrate this numerically using, for example, Markov chain Monte Carlo. But if you do assume that the, the noise is Gaussian, then you can just compute the marginal likelihood analytically, which is very fast. And that's why people, even though it's called Gaussian process, regression and classification, that does not mean that you need to assume that the uncertainty is Gaussian. It means that you can use other distributions, but if you use Gaussian, it's just much faster. I hope it, it uh, helps understanding uh, this uh, better. Now, uh, more importantly than that, much more importantly for this talk, is the fact that when you do this, when you do Gaussian processes, the limitation is that you have to invert that covariance matrix or moment matrix in mesh-free, which is a very expensive operation to do. In fact, it scales cubically to the number of data points that you have in the data set. In practice, what this means is that you can only go up to, let's say, about 10,000 points in your data. Now, if you want to learn something, just like the metamaterial that I'm discussing here, that is seven dimensions and noise, 10,000 points is usually not enough, okay? So that's why also some people refrain from saying that Gaussian processes are a machine learning method because it's usually applied to small data. But recently, the, there, there are a few groups, but basically the Cambridge, the Oxford, and the Sheffield group, all the, the English schools, have been pushing very hard for uh, developments in this field, and they proposed what is called the sparse Gaussian processes uh, uh, which is a, an, a, an evolution of the method based on a very, very, very simple idea. It's based on the idea of the Nystrom approximation, which is a low-rank matrix approximation for your matrix. If you're familiar with singular value decomposition, it's more or less the same idea, where you have different eigenvectors and you chop the remaining ones. This is the same thing for this case. So you have a matrix and you now define a certain point, a certain number of points called inducing points the M, and now your inducing points are much smaller than the number of points that you have in the training, da uh, training data set, okay? So the takeaway, this was the boring stuff, now the, the cool stuff will, will, will start. The takeaway is that you have a method that is extremely rigorous. In fact, is, is one of the best approximators that exists. But it was slow before, now it isn't anymore. It's scalable. And the idea is then that you select some points in the data set to be inducing points, and then you invert that matrix easily, and you can scale up to a much larger data set. OK, great. So uh, back to our story. Basically, we want to design this metamaterial, and we want to do that by defining the sampling. We did. Running simulations, getting the database, and then conducting the Bayesian machine learning using sparse Gaussian processes. And here's the result. What you can get is uh, a map of your properties, and there's a lot of information here, so let's, let's go slowly here. So first of all, there's two things here. There's both machine learning classification and machine learning regression. Both are in the same plot. First classification, which means the white part over there corresponds to regions of the space 
that the cell does not coil. For example, if you have a very tall cell, you apply compression, it will bend, right? So that would be, those points would be in the white part over there. The colored part is the evolution of the critical buckling stress that you have within the space. And the solid black lines represent the energy absorbed by, by the material, okay, the metamaterial. Now, these four plots are just showing, so I'm changing two parameters, and I'm changing the height of the cell, you see over there. And as you see, of course, as you increase the height, bending becomes dominating. And then, of course, you don't have super compressibility, so then your region of interest starts shrinking, which is depicted over there. More importantly than this, because these are mean properties, more importantly is the fact, like I said, that sparse Gaussian processes can also predict the uncertainty, which is what's here represented in this plot. So this value is the mean of the buckling stress, and the lines are the energy absorbed, like I said, but this represents the uncertainty, the standard deviation. And as you can see here, we pick the random point in the white dot over there, and there's 236 realizations there, so this is the effect of noise. This is not used in training, of course. And then this is the, the, the statistical distribution of the energy absorbed that you get, right? And as you can see here, the mean value is 23.34 kilojoule per millimeter cubed, and the standard deviation is 0 0.46. Of course, we predict very well the mean, and the standard deviation we predict about double, 0 0.8, which makes sense because our uncertainty prediction is both the real uncertainty of the actual physical metamaterial plus the model uncertainty in our prediction. So it had to be bigger than what we have in the data set. Of course, we did this exhaustively, both with cross-validation and with examples that were not even in the data set. So I'm just showing you three, of course, but there's another uh, example here. So this is another case. And again, you see that the response is completely different from the, the previous one. This was the previous one. This is the next one. And you see that uh, it's completely different. The values are also quite different. And you see that the uncertainty now is bigger, 0.64, almost double. And of course, we predict as well about 1.3, which is again about double what we had over there. Of course, remember, we are assuming that the, our distribution is Gaussian, which is not truly the case here, but it actually predicts quite well how the uncertainty is, is evolving. So that you believe me, I'm also showing one of the worst points that we got, which is this one where uh, the standard deviation is 0 0.3 more or less, but we predict about uh, 0 0.8, which is a little bit, not three times, but two point something times. But the, the idea is that it's about double uh, the prediction of the, the standard deviation that we get compared to the actual data set. So once you define this Bayesian machine learning uh, model, you can play with it and you can do a lot of things. One of them is even if you have incomplete data, you can do sensitivity analysis. So you can start saying that, for example, the cross-sectional area of the longerons and the ratio of shear modulus and Young's modulus is actually not very important. It, the, the properties of interest, buckling load and energy, don't depend on it. But for some others, for example, the, the second moment of area in the x direction is, is more important for the buckling load but less important for the energy, energy absorption and so on and so forth, right? So you can also use machine learning and sensitivity analysis to reduce your space and then facilitate optimization afterwards, correct? So if you run optimization, and in this problem it's actually fairly easy, so I'm not focusing too much on the optimization part, but you can pick your favorite optimization algorithm and you can optimize for whatever it is now, instead of running the finite element simulations, you use the machine learning model as a surrogate, which is very well known a practice to do robust optimization. And you can, for example, have two responses like, like you see here. So this one is what you get or close to the maximum energy absorbed, and this is what you get to close to the maximum buckling load, which is over there. The buckling load for this is down here, then it's all post buckling. Okay, so, uh, okay, Miguel, why does this matter? Well, I think it matters because once you build this, you get several advantages. First, you smooth your design space and you characterize uncertainty. So it's much easier to do optimization afterwards. Second, 
you have a surrogate model that you can use to then optimize and find new optima, which is ideal for metamaterial analysis because you want to tune them. Everyone talks about tuning metamaterials. Nobody's doing this, and I don't know why. Because you should just build the surrogate, optimize then, and that optimization then becomes fast, very practical, and you can optimize your material for particular cases. I know that you cannot read these plots. That's not the point. The point is to show that you can tune it. I'm going to highlight one of them that I found very, very curious, which is in this case, if you change the torsion constant of your material, you see that there's a dramatic change in the stress-strain response. But interestingly, the area below the curve almost doesn't change. This was not reported in the literature at all. And you see that the sensitivity analysis told us exactly that. You see here that it says that it's very sensitive, the buckling load to the torsion constant, but not the energy absorption, which is exactly what these plots show afterwards as well. OK, so there's more, but I'm going to skip this. Uh, then uh, one of my students got really excited. And uh, he was like, well, Miguel, look, then if we build this stuff with carbon nanotubes, we put an I-beam in the cross section, we can get a super strong, super compressible material absorber with maximum load above 100 megapascal and incredible properties, okay? 90% compression and so on. Now, this is very common for all of us in computational mechanics, right? We, we are living in the virtual world and we like to, to push for the limits. But if you want to build this thing, it's not going to be easy to 3D print this, this, this stuff in carbon nanotubes. So I was like, okay, Piotr, that's great, but let's, let's go back to Earth a little bit and see. We show that we can actually tune the metamaterial with machine learning, but can we build it? Because so far we had done zero experiments. So we set about to doing that, just that. The support staff of Delft were completely saying that I was insane, but we, we went along and tried to do it. And we, to do that, we did something very simple. We said, okay, uh, we have to 3D print this with an inexpensive 3D printer, uh, Ultimaker 2, in PLA, which is a very brittle material. So let's simplify this based on the sensitivity analysis and say, okay, uh, let's consider circular cross sections for the longerons, so no, no fancy cross sections, and uh, let's see if we, if we can do this. Okay, so what do we need to do? All right, so first, you characterize the base material. In this case, it's PLA. So very simple tests, okay? Uniaxial tension, compression, shear, and that was about it. And you define uh, the diameter. So the specimen was a longeron of 1.5 millimeters. You, and you define the mean values and the standard deviation for all of this. Uh, Young's modulus, shear modulus, diameter. And I want to point out that the yield, surface, the yield strain, sorry, it's about 2%. And the fracture strain is about between 3 and 4%. So this is a very, very brittle material. We want to achieve super compressibility, remember, right? And there's a lot of defects here. This is what a cross-section looks like in those inexpensive 3D printers. So what's the goal? The goal is to transform this metamaterial into something coilable, super compressible, but reversible. We want to get back and do this over and over and over again. But now we know that the yield strain is about 2%. So what we did was very simple. The simplest possible yield strain criterion, maximum strain, and said, OK, if the local strain is above 2%, we classify this as coilable, but not reversible. So plasticity will start to occur and later fracture. And then you just need to take the, the, the database and classify into three regions. The red region that you see there is what you, was the white before. So the red region here is not coilable, not interesting designs. The blue region is coilable, but the local strain is above 2%, so it would plastify or break. And the yellow region here is uh, coilable but reversible. So this is saying, again, without doing experiments, that it's actually possible to have these materials, coilable and reversible, to, 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 to uh, um, uh, obtain this, this behavior. So we did that. Uh, we printed these things. And this is the result. What you see here, then, we, we reduced the space from seven dimensions to three. And the dot over there is the experiment. And the black line is the experimental value with the standard deviation over there. 
and the blue line is the finite element prediction for that point and the standard deviation taking into account the material uh, properties, which were really wide because of the 3D printing process. You can actually have some fun and, and invert this unit cell, put two of them together, and actually achieve super compressibility uh, by rotating the middle ring over there and keeping the tops uh, fixed. And um, this was one of the first prints we did, really. It was really one of the first prints we did. And uh, it comes back. So we were very happy, but I didn't want to stop there because I wanted to be a material, not a structure. So Delft has a mo uh, more than a million dollar uh, 3D printer, two photon nanolithography, nanoscribe. And uh, well, this computational person set about of learning some experiments. I'm pretty terrible at it, but I made it. And uh, I went there, learned how, to, how it works, and built a monolithic piece. It's slightly different from the other one because here, I introduced some horizontal elements. So it, it's not pinned. It's a, a full solid piece where these horizontal elements torsion. But everything else stays the same. And uh, you can see here that this is how it looks like in the SEM. This is uh, during the compression. This is what you have. So that the dashed line is a second cycle that is exactly the same. And it's very reversible. It's exactly reversible. If you push the cell too much, then you start seeing that it's not fully reversible. There's some plasticity going on, but it's actually quite small. But I have a little video for you that shows that uh, the material is actually uh, changing. I'm going to speed it up a little bit. So these are ten different, three different cycles. First cycle, second cycle, and tenth cycle. And you see that it goes down and it comes back up in all these different cycles. Okay? And this is smaller than a grain of sand. The diameter of that ring is 200 microns. Okay, so we were very happy. And my message to you is that materials of the future need to be adaptive, multipurpose, and tunable. But I also think, I have a little suggestion, stop with trial and error and embrace machine learning and optimization. It really, really helps. But I, don't want to, I want to finish by, without generalizing this to something uh, more uh, important. The question then becomes, is, it pro is this possible? Does this work for every problem? And the answer is that in theory, yes. In theory, you can do this for materials, for structures, and so on. But there are important challenges to address, OK? So if we go back to this data-driven framework that we worked on in 2017 and 2018, you define the design of experiments, you do analysis, you build the response database, you have the machine learning, and then you conduct optimization. But you have to make sure that your simulations are fast enough, because if they're not fast enough, like plasticity and fracture simulations, then you don't build a big enough database and you cannot use machine learning afterwards. This is a key issue that the first plenary speaker talked about as well for fluids. And here, I want to make a little pause and acknowledge two of the most, or one of, some of the most important people in my short career so far. Of course, Wing Kam Lu, my advisor, but my brilliant colleague, who never ceases to amaze me, Zilian Lu, who basically came up with, a, with an incredible method. My contribution was, was small. I, I, I think I sparked it by having the, the idea of the compression. But basically, this new method that we created called self-consistent clustering analysis uh, is based on two ideas of compressing the information and solving the Lippmann-Schwinger equation. And I'm not going to talk to you about this today, but I just want to say that we transformed simulations from plasticity, 3D plasticity of composites that take one day in a supercomputer to five seconds to four minutes in a laptop with a MATLAB code. So you can see where we're going with this, because then, of course, we could do, instead of FEM, we can use SCA, and we can span the design space and do the data-driven framework all over again to find the highest toughness of a composite and so on. Never forget, if you don't like SCA, you can use another reduced order model. But efficiency is absolutely key. To wrap up, I want to share with you some uh, other recent work that I'm involved with, uh, which is uh, a big challenge as well. So far, this machine learning maps were one-to-one, -one, meaning that you have inputs and you have an output, and that's it. But if you want to learn the behavior, the plastic behavior of the materials, that's much harder to do. Because as, you, as we know, plasticity 
is dependent on the history of the loading that you have. You can strain the material, and then you can strain it again, and if you go through a different path, you'll have a different answer. There's no superposition principle like in elasticity. So this map is not one-to-one. -one. So the question then becomes, and it's interesting, Rodney Hill in his famous book, the second chapter starts like this. With present knowledge, the element of time cannot be adequately incorporated in a mathematical account of the plasticity of metals. I interpreted this as an effect from history dependency. It's difficult to take into account the dependency on the load paths, but also visco viscose effects. What I want to share with you is that we were actually able, and, uh, and before I want to acknowledge my brilliant colleagues, uh, uh, Morstaba Mozaffar and Ramin Bostanabad, who, who we worked together on, on actually learning plasticity laws by using uh, deep learning. So deep learning is a big buzzword. Most of the time you don't need it. Machine learning will just do for our problems. But if you need to learn history dependency, you need sequence learning, a type of deep learning. And recurrent neural networks are one of the few, place, few algorithms that can do that. So what I'm showing you here, and it has to be quick, I'm sorry, but if you have questions, we'll, we'll go through it. These are three different loading paths that you're loading this RVE that I came up with, the Smiley RVE. And then uh, you load this RVE with different loading paths. And then you do exactly the same with the data-driven framework, but you use recurrent neural networks instead of using any other machine learning ma method, okay? Now, we can talk about this, I would love to, but there's many ways that you can do this. Most of them are pretty bad. Recurrent neural networks are very difficult to train. They're notoriously diff difficult to train. So we tried a few different architectures, combining with fully connected neural networks as well, because there's both temporal and non-temporal inputs here, right? The non-temporal would be, for example, volume fraction of the, of the RVE. So we tried a few different uh, architectures. We came up with, so we're using also uh, GRUs, gated recurrent units, instead of uh, long uh, short-term memory uh, gates, which are a little bit better, less overfitting. But let me skip those details and just show you the results. So these are predictions. They are not tests. They are not training sets. This is a test set, and this is a loading condition that this didn't happen. And what you see is that the recurrent neural network learns the complete plastic behavior and the energy, the plastic energy. You see that it's monotonically increasing. There was not no restriction to being monotonically increasing, and it does that for different loading conditions. We were pretty amazed. Finally, because Michael Ortiz got a big award, and actually I found uh, uh, this really nice paper. It's one of his first papers. It's not very much cited. But uh, in, in the abstract, he says, we want to motivate the need for accurate distortional hardening rules in computation. And this was in 83. What he was referring to is the very difficult challenge of finding yield laws and plastic laws that track the distortional hardening that happens in the material because it's evolving as your loading conditions change. With our RNNs, we got this for free. We didn't fit for it, we didn't look for it, we just predicted it. And what you see here is that the distortion of the yield surface when you load along different loading conditions and the dashed lines are the, um, the, the data and the solid lines, the recurrent neural network response. So all these complicated models from, for example, Frederick Barlat, Michael Ortiz, and so on, on plasticity, they are trying to really tr trigger and, and, and describe very difficult plastic phenomena were learned by the RNN right away. And we did not define a plastic potential. We did not define a yield surface. We did not define a hardening law. We learned directly from the data from different loading paths. And we did this also for composite materials or different microstructures in the same zone. So I want to wrap up by just uh, having a simple message. Machine learning for me is more than a buzzword. It's our future. I cannot wait to see what y'all can do with it. Thank you very much.